of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, so he, she's obviously spent a lot of time in Alaska. She's lived in Alaska. She's traveled all over and she has written a number of book, renowned books about lands all across Alaska. The book that she will talk about a lot tonight is On Arctic Ground, which provides an in-depth look at the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. And so we're really excited to hear about her experience on the ground and about writing the book and just the values that she has seen firsthand in this incredible piece of public land. So we may have a little bit more time, but um, uh, just so that I can turn it over to Debbie, I was gonna attempt to summarize the, his, the, the hundred year history of the National Petroleum Reserve in the next two minutes. So I'm gonna give a very brief overview to just kind of give you a little context for this piece of public land, let Debbie speak, and then we can have a little bit more of a conversation about where things stand today. Um, so the area, this area in Northeast Alaska is the traditional homeland to the Inupiat people. And still today, there are a number of Inupiat villages that exist both within and surrounding the federal valley, uh, the federal boundaries. And these are communities that depend on the resources of this land and the surrounding waters for their way of life. The MPRA, as it's called, was first federally designated in 1923. And at that time, it was a petroleum reserve for the US Navy. But then over time and many years later in 1976, that management was transferred to the Department of Interior. So this is important because when that management was transferred over to DOI, the Department of Interior, that change in management structure meant that this piece of public land needed to be managed not only as a means of, of providing petroleum for our country, but it needed to be managed for all of its values, which now includes protecting to the maximum extent possible, the ecological and subsistence values of the area. So that, since the, you know, that, that, that was in 1970, around the 90s, um, these some, the, there started being sort of a ping pong of management plans for the reserve. So this is obviously a little bit of a contradictory management directives. Um, and so through various administrations that came in power, the, manage, the management of the reserve and the priority of that management has ping pong back and forth, depending on the administration that happens to be in power. That kind of led to us to a lot of the work we did in 2013. Um, so it, you know, in, in the Obama era, the Alaska Wilderness League worked really hard with communities on the ground, with advocates and constituencies across the country, and really closely with the Obama administration on securing a management plan for the entirety of the reserve that protected 11 million acres of the area. And it really prioritized um, key layers of protection for the most important ecological areas, which are called special areas. Debbie's going to talk a little bit about what those special areas are, but that's one of the key management directives is that, that we see that management priority for the most ecologically sensitive areas. So that happened. Um, and then we fast forward and then we get to the Trump administration. And, you know, as you all know, a lot of bad stuff happened during the Trump administration, including to the National Petroleum Reserve. And they basically ended up bulldozering over that 2013 plan. Um, it was really in their final days in office, that they finally just jammed through this very ill-conceived management plan that ultimately basically just opened the entire area up for development and pretty much just eviscerated all the special area protections that existed. Um, so that was obviously disappointing. Another aspect of this sort of 100 year management history for the reserve that's, that, that's probably a little less known and, and kind of interesting is despite the fact that we've been fighting over management um, for really for decades, that it's been set aside for, for oil in some ways since the 20s, um, really development within the bounds of the reserve is actually relatively recent. Um, they've been leasing it for, uh, you know, for a couple of decades, but it wasn't until 2015 that oil really started being produced within the bounds of the reserve. So that, that development is actually relatively recent, but since that 2015 beginning of development, project after project has really been approved and it's gone really fast since then. And so this expanse in development that's relatively recent, while it's been happening really fast, the necessary science and scientific assessment of the effects of that development, especially on the, piece, uh, on the people that live there and the resources they depend on, has not been keeping up with that, um, with that expanse and development. And so 
you know, before we talk about where we are today and where we want to get with the issue, that's really the context in which, you know, Debbie will talk about the values if, if we, if Rosemary is able to join and she'll talk about the realities of that development and the effects it has on her people. And that's, and that's the backdrop under which we all want to really work to learn about this area, tell the story of this area and talk to the administration about protecting this area. So I'll leave it at that for now, turn it over to Debbie and, and we'll have a conversation. So thank you, Debbie. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was a great brief history. I think that that really helps people get an idea of, of where we are with this hundred year look at the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska. Um, it was called the Naval Petroleum Reserve and the Navy ran things until 1976. And there was quite a bit of exploration that went on in the 1940s um, with World War II, there was an interest in maybe finding you know, more, more oil and the Navy drilled uh, about 80 wells. Most of them were not successful with the exception of the northeastern corner of the, of the National Petroleum Reserve. And that's where the interest is, is today. Um, I'm in Sitka actually today. And I wanted to say that I'm in the ancestral homelands of the Tlingit people. So I'm a, a far cry from the far north. Um, but I'm, I'm so grateful for the Alaska Wilderness League and all the work um, that has been done to date to protect the special areas in this amazing place that I'm gonna share with you. Um, and thanks too for recognizing Adam who was passionate about protecting not only the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge but also this Western Arctic region that I'll be sharing some images with you. Um, we, we carry on the torch for Adam we honor him and um, in this way, um, I think we, we have hope uh, for the future. We have a, a current administration that believes that we should have no new oil and gas leasing on public lands in America because he understands climate change. And so this, these are hopeful times for us when we look at the Western Arctic and we look at its history, um, the values there are something that are otherworldly to me as an explorer. And, um, and before I get started, I do want to give a special thank you to um, the person who had the idea that we should carefully look, explore, and document what was in the National Petroleum Reserve. And that is Tom Campion, who was the former chair of the Alaska Wilderness League. And Tom came up with the idea and he said, we need a book about this place. We need to share the values of, of this beautiful, magnificent wilderness. And he said, let's get on it, get to it. And so there I went in 2009. It was a, it was a four year project, three major expeditions, about 60 days that I spent traveling by inflatable canoe on foot to learn about this remote region. Um, up until that time, I had spent many years exploring the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge which is an extraordinary um, place that I had grown to love and cherish, I never thought for a second of going west and looking at the petroleum reserve because it sounded like a place that wasn't really friendly to somebody that was looking for beauty and wilderness and wildlife. It sounded like a place where there would be oil rigs and factories and facilities. Um, so I, I, I never thought of, of going into that area until this idea that we should look at the wholeness of it, 23 million acres, the largest um, public lands unit that we have in America, 10 times the size of Yellowstone National Park. Um, it's about the size of the state of Maine, this area that I'm gonna be sharing with you. Um, and in the travels, the places that I'll be taking you are in two of the special areas, the Colville River Special Area and the Utakak, Utakak Upland Special Area. You'll get a sense of what the Brooks Range and the foothills of the Brooks Range, and then moving out onto the slope along the Colville River, you'll see these the values that are in this area. I'm gonna try to share my screen now. Hopefully technology will be friendly and we can pull it up here. Uh, there we are, there it is. Thank goodness it's there. And we will just pull up the first slide and you will be in the National Petroleum Reserve. Um, so at the start of our exploration, it was a bit like being um, thrown back in time. You felt like it was a Lewis and Clark moment. We were dropped off in a, in a bush plane 
uh, near the headwaters of the Naigu River is what you're looking at here, looking across the Brooks Range um, on would be the southernmost part of the National Petroleum Reserve, which includes the Brooks Range, which includes the foothills of the Brooks, Brooks, uh, Brooks Range. On the fringe is where we were. Um, this is June and it was a, a, a pretty cold early June. You can see it's not really greening up too much yet. The, the tundra is still brown. Um, you can see the expansiveness of the country. Um, once we arrived here and we're alone and there were four of us, uh, we'll move to that picture. This was, this was our team of explorers. Hugh Rose, the photographer here that you'll see many of the pictures and Patrick Ender, some of his pictures. And on this trip and his uh, nephew, Angus, 21 years old, really strong guy who could carry all the head, do all the heavy, heavy lifting, which was wonderful. So this was our crew. And uh, we ended up spending two weeks, this crew together. And then those three left, those three guys left. And then I was with another gentleman who joined me for the Colville River portion. The, the time spent on these river drainages as we floated and hiked was 30 days floating from the headwaters of this river, the Naigu, into the Atibalik, into the Colville, and all the way to New Wixit, where Rosemary is right now and hopefully will be joining us. So this was basically a 400 mile journey uh, in terms of river miles. And having been in, across much of Alaska on foot and, and traveling by kayak, I was stunned by the fact that, that there, were, there were no boundaries, that the landscape was boundless, that you could see forever in all directions and not have a sense that not only there were, there were no other people there and lots of wildlife, we never heard an airplane. And that is because we were so far in a remote part of the Brooks Range um, that we were 200 miles from the, from the Hall Road. We were 300 miles from the Chukchi Sea to the west. We were about 300 miles from Barrow, the northernmost town in, in America. So you get a sense we were out there and it, it took a long time to get out there by plane, you know, a good, from the Hall Road, a good two hours of flying just to get to this point. So I'm emphasizing the fact that it was remote it was wild and it was the most vast landscape that I had ever witnessed in my life. And um, so we floated this, this river and um, had a, oops, gonna get the arrow here. This gives you a sense of our route. We started right at this little red line which follows the Colville River. Here's Nuiqsut, Umiat, which is an oil field construction camp up to the, where the Tivlik River merges to the Colville. We started right up here. If you can see my cursor, hopefully, right in the, in the Brooks Range. So this was the 400 mile journey. Um, and this is the development area around Prudhoe Bay, the state lands that are, have gradually been consumed by pipelines and roads and facilities. Um, and uh, gives you a sense in the Arctic Refuge the one area that is off limits. This represents 5% of the North Slope, the area that is being contested right now as far as oil and gas exploration and development, 5%. The other 95% of Alaska's North Slope is either open for oil and gas exploration or development, or it's under development. In, in the case of around the fields around Prudhoe Bay, there are about 30 producing fields in this region here. So not one acre west of the Arctic Refuge, not one acre is permanently protected. So that's about 43 million acres of land that has been reserved for possible oil and gas exploration and development. And that's why we're working so hard to protect the Arctic Refuge, because it is a rare place where this has been off limits for, you know, since the time that it was established in 1960. And then this whole area, um, most of it is wild, meets the wilderness uh, definition criteria. So um, that's where we're going. So in June, this is when the flowers start to 
emerge and um, it's a beautiful time when, when everything comes bursting to life. The, the flowers such as this glacier of Venns, you can see the little uh, furry hairs on the stems and on um, the leaves. There's a purpose for this. This helps the plant uh, absorb heat. It helps the plant flower sooner and make seeds. And it helps the plant retain moisture. So you see a lot of, of tundra plants that are like this, that have these little furry hairs like an animal that actually have a purpose to help that plant survive in the harsh condi conditions that we have in the Arctic. Um, the northern wheat here, I got to say, this is my favorite songbird in the Arctic because of its story. They've done research on this bird that is makes it one of the, the greatest ambassadors that we would have in the bird world. This bird spends its summer in the Arctic where it nests in rock cavities and where it eats all kinds of insects, spiders and bugs and whatever it can find on the tundra and the grasses. And then when, it, when it's uh, raised its young, it takes off and flies to Africa. And so this is about a 18,000 mile round trip, mile round trip going east to west. And then in the winter, if you were in Africa, if you were on the Serengeti, if you were in Tanzania or, or Tanzania or in Kenya, you might see this same bird feeding on grasshoppers next to a herd of zebras or giraffes or elephants. And then at the end of February, they start making their migration going back to Alaska. It takes them about three months to fly. They usually fly at night. They've put geolocators on these birds and they know when they take off. They're flying when the air is cool. They have the navigation built into their little brains somehow. We don't really truly understand how a bird in Alaska born in the Brooks Range can fly uh, 9,000 miles to Africa and join the elephants. I mean, this is a miracle, this bird. So you can tell I'm just a little excited about the Northern Weed Ear. Uh, it's the only bird that's born in the New World and goes back to the Old World for the winter. So it makes it a very unusual bird. But let's look at one that everybody might see. How about um, another bird that we think of that's um, a common bird that you would see in, in many states in, the, in, uh, in America. This would, this would be our campsite where we set up. You can see there's a tripod there getting ready to take some photos. Uh, these guys are professionals. Hugh and Patrick did a phenomenal job photographing um, you know, our trip. And um, they were at that particular moment, they were taking um, this little bird. So that is the beautiful voice of the American tree sparrow. It's just a little sparrow. And the voice was uh, recorded by Richard Nelson my uh, partner who passed away in November of 2019. His recordings and his stories and voice and his voice lives on through his wonderful programs that he produced for the public, the encountersnorth.org if you're interested in listening to the wildlife sounds and his natural history programs, they will live on forever. Um, and um, so the sounds you'll be hearing in this program were all recorded by Nels as he was known. and. This particular bird built this nest. And what was, what was unusual about this, this beautiful little sparrow nest is that about 20 feet from it was the carcass of a ptarmigan, a willow ptarmigan. And the white feathers were all scattered on the ground. And so this little bird had picked up each individual feather and crafted this beautiful insulated nest for its young. And the ptarmigan probably fed a gyrofalcon that was nearby. There, there are lots of raptors in the National Petroleum Reserve. And so perhaps that was a meal for the gyrofalcon and the feathers became a home for the American tree sparrow. Wolf tracks abounded. We, we were lucky enough uh, early on on our trip to be surrounded by a pack of wolves, which is, something that's so rare when you're in such a wild place where the wolves were actually curious about these humans 
that had landed that were camping on a gravel bar not too far from their den. And so one morning we were eating our granola, drinking coffee, and we heard them singing and howling within a few miles of our camp. And the next thing, we, within about a half an hour, we saw three wolves that were surrounding our camp and they were just checking us out. This one looked like a, a German shepherd to me. Um, this white one was uh, to the south of us with the little white tufts on its, on its ears. And then the third one started howling at us. I hope you can all hear that. I hope you hear it. This sounds great. Um, it, it, it's something to hear a wolf howl in the wild when you're in this kind of country. Um, you feel so grateful for the experience, especially knowing that you know these wolves have been persecuted uh, across the world. You know, it used to be the most common mammal in the continental United States, and and then we lost them all. They were all you know, exterminated, shot off in competition with agriculture and ranchers and so on, and then reintroduced. And now they've been coming back and there's still controversy over wolves uh, and ranchers. And, um, and yet here, the wolves can be, can roam freely. They can have their territory and you can watch them with their pups and they're safe from um, being attacked by aerial gunners, which in, in the case of Alaska, we had our, our share of, uh, of aerial wolf hunters that could, could pick them off. This is so far removed from any chance of, of them being threatened that they can truly be wild in, a, in an area that is hundreds of miles from the nearest town or village. We used inflatable Metzler canoes, which were great for going down the Naigu, um, bumping along the, the rocks. We only had a, a few mishaps. We did capsize, and uh, that was that was a, a day I'll never forget because the temperature of the water was about 36, 37 degrees, and you quickly uh, become hypothermic when you're swimming in an Arctic river. So we quickly changed clothes and we just lay on the tundra and let the sun. Uh, bat we basked basically in the sun out of the wind. Uh, for about three or four hours before we, we stopped shivering. So that kind of gives you an idea of the chill of Arctic water. It's not something you want to swim in or be in for very long, learned the hard way. Um, walking across this landscape, again, it's a forever wilderness. Um, big skies, endless tundra, no trees to mask the environment. So you see everything before you. You spot caribou that are miles and miles away if you have a good set of binoculars. Um, so the land is before you full of life. It may look empty when you first look at it, but then if you study it carefully, you start to recognize the little brown dots that are moving in the distance. Oh, it's a caribou herd or a grizzly bear. <clears throat> And then at this time of year, you've got, again, another example of a very hairy plant, the woolly lousewort, which has this woolly material that protects its leaves and stem, stems. And in the week or two that we were traveling through this country, this plant went from the woolly phase to this beautiful flowering plant in full bloom, the woolly lousewort, which the caribou love to eat this flower, this plant. It's very high in carbohydrates, so they'll go out of their way to to pick off a woolly lousewort. <clears throat> this is a place we hiked to, a Tivalik Lake, which um, really shows the history of this area in terms of human use um, for thousands of years. Um, in this particular case, we're walking across an area where there used to be sod houses that sunk into the, the, those grassy areas there next to the edge of the lake. Uh, people lived here year round because there, there was a good supply of fish in the lake and there were signs of little pit caches near the, 
the edge of the lake where people had stored their fish. Um, and I, I, I was able to meet an archeolo uh, archeologist, I'm trying to find my arrow here, um, an archeologist uh, with BLM who had studied, studied this area. And he had um, discovered in a little patch of, of dirt, the most amazing thing, um, a little pocket that had three of these beads and a copper bangle and, a, and an iron sort of pendant that probably he thinks uh, was part of a, of, a, of a necklace that somebody wore. He was very curious about those beads. Like, where did they come from? How old were those beads? And so he started researching and he traced them to Venice. So these beads were made in Venice and then he was able to do the radiocarbon dating because there was a piece of willow that was wrapped around that bangle and having that organic material allowed him to date this little part of a necklace, which was dated back to the early 1400s, which meant that people were trading items across Asia, all the way from Venice, hand to hand through car caravans. And then people would bring these beads across the Bering Strait up the Noatak River to this distant remote lake where, where someone was making a necklace out of them. Long before Columbus discovered America, there was trading going on between Europe and a place as remote as a Tivolik Lake um, in the National Petroleum Reserve, which I find pretty phenomenal um, history. People have lived in this area for thousands of years, hunted, fished, seasonal camps all across the Brooks Range. Um, and this is just an example of that, that gives you a sense that there was movement of people across the Bering Strait and trading. Well, you cannot walk anywhere in the Western Arctic without seeing thousands and thousands of um, tracks and trails etching into the tundra. This is just a, a beautiful photo that illustrates this. Um, the Western Arctic caribou herd is, is the largest herd we have in our nation. Um, it's, it's been as high as over 400,000 animals. Today, it's about 250 to 300,000 in that range um, that, that live in this area, that give birth to their calves, as many as 100,000 calves can be born in a one week to two week time frame, and they migrate through the, the Western Arctic, many different routes. Their range, if you can imagine, the range of this herd is so large, this is such a high number of animals, that the range is as big as California. Now imagine a herd that would need a range as large as the state of California. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about the Western Arctic herd tens of thousands of animals. Um, along the river, we often uh, would, would see caribou crossing in front of us, like you, like you see here, um, members of that Western Arctic herd. And then sometimes traveling down, down the river. Um, this was an unusual kind of a day. Uh, Patrick was, was paddling and, and I'm in the front and we didn't realize it, but a grizzly bear was watching us as we, as we paddled down the Nigu River. And the only reason we found out was Hugh Rose, the photographer was up on a ridge and he happened to, he was trying to get a picture of us coming down the river. And when he looked through the viewfinder, there was a grizzly bear watching us in his viewfinder of the camera. So he took the picture and then we later on saw it and we were completely surprised that this bear had been watching us as we paddled by. And we wondered how often does that happen? When you are traveling through wilderness, there are animals all over the place and they are probably watching you from behind a willow bush or someplace where you have no idea, or you just don't see them as you're moving along through the country. This is a, a bear that was walking along a snow patch right next to the river where we were traveling. And sometimes you see them up close. And this, this particular bear on the Naigu stood up. I think, uh, I think I saw that Dave Scheffler, I think is on the, on the uh, 
on tonight. And he took this picture, Dave, I know you're there because I saw your name flash on the screen. So this is, this is a great picture that Dave took on our, on our second trip down the Naigu uh, with, uh, with, with Dave, the photographer who was, was on board that one with Tom Campion. And as I recall, there were six other guys that were on that trip. It was a wonderful trip. And this bear got very close to our camp, startled me as I was getting out of the tent and, uh, we banged pots and pans, and of course, it it, it took off. <clears throat> there, the grizzly bear population in the in the Western Arctic is the highest concentration of grizzly bears in northern Alaska, and that's because of all the caribou. You've got uh, high concentrations of wolverines, grizzly bears, and they're all following the caribou. This is a great source of protein and food for for the bears and the wolverines. And so you get high concentrations and you have to be really watchful of the bears when you're camping. Um, as you're coming down the river, you see lots of these, these cliffs, which are um, great habitat for raptors, golden eagles, peregrines, jeer falcons, rough-legged hawks. And, and then on the gravel bars, sometimes you see a, a nest of eggs, that, uh, a nest of a, a Canada geese or a white-fronted uh, goose would have built this nest in close proximity to the raptors. <laughs> Rough-legged hawk, um, lots of, of, of hawks, lots of Jeer falcons, in this case, we were, they were, they're using large lenses here, so we were pretty far away from, from this jeer falcon. We were not this close to the nest because that would have been too close, but they have huge lenses and you, you're able to see this uh, nesting jeer falcon. And they live in the, in the Arctic year round if there are enough ptarmigan to eat. That's their main source of food. And, uh, and they really stand out in the summer, in the, the males particularly, like this one. has to be my favorite ptarmigan recording. You know, these birds, they mutter, they talk all night long because there is no night. It's 24 hour daylight. So the, the ptarmigan, you can be trying to sleep at one or two in the morning and, and they're going off, like, you know, talking like, you know, muttering old men. Um, but they, they are a favorite food of, of the uh, jeer falcon. Uh, this is coming out more out of the foothills, you're starting to look out across the North Slope, which is endless, about 200, 300 miles going towards the Arctic Ocean of just rolling, undulated, undulating tundra and, and uh, mountains and pingos and, um, and then this beautiful bright patch of, of uh, moss campion that was in full bloom on this relatively naked, austere sort of setting there with the Puvak Rock ridge this is called. We also called it Stegosaurus Ridge because it looked like the back of a Stegosaurus dinosaur, which also lived in this area. If we go back 70 million years, there were um, uh, about 13 species at last count of dinosaurs that were, would have been roaming around here. So very different looking place if you go back to those, those early, earlier times. Um, you feel like a speck a speck of life when you're in a, in a landscape like this. And there are few, few places left in the world that are this vast and wild where you're the only person standing on this ridge above the Ativiluk River here. Um, phenomenal feeling of wildness that I felt really in no other place uh, that is as big as this Western Arctic region. And when you look out across the North Slope, Lupin, what a surprise. A, a, a flower we're all familiar with grows prolifically in this area uh, along the Colville River. And this is the upper Colville River, which is, has lots of important habitat for moose, 
for caribou, for the wetlands around the area. Pacific lunar. There are about four species, I, I believe, of loons that are that are in the Western Arctic, and this is one of them. We've got the yellow-billed loons, the red-throated loons, the common loons. So um, there are so many lakes and ponds in the wetlands of the Western Arctic region that that there there are enough ponds for thousands of these these waterfowl-type birds. The swans, the loons love this area because they can have their own lake their own pond with no competition. Um, pintail ducks, lots of different species of ducks and geese and shorebirds that utilize the wetlands. Very important for nesting and uh, also for molting. The geese particularly rely on the wetlands of Teshpuk Lake, which is another special area um, for molting. So um, as we move down the Colville, you can see here how big this river is. It's a dangerous river uh, in my mind because if you happen to capsize, you might as well say goodbye because this is a big river, deep river, fairly swift river, and it's also incredibly windy because there, there's nothing to break the wind. Um, so we had to be extremely careful. We, there were days where we could not travel on the river because of the wind. And we hunkered down in the willows just waiting for a calm evening or a calm morning that we could launch and continue the, the travels. The Colville River is the largest river that we have in the Arctic and it drains half of the Brooks Range. Half of the rivers in the Brooks Mountain Range drain into the Colville. So that's why it's, it's so big all the way to the Arctic Ocean. Well, when you get to, a, there's a turn along the, along the river where a big jog where the river suddenly cuts to the north. And at that junction, um, there's a place called Umiat, which is an oil exploration camp for many years. The Navy operated out of this area with helicopters and rollagons and tundra vehicles, um, you know, looking for oil. And so we stopped here and and somebody put up a funny sign just to make people laugh as you arrived at, at Umiat, you know, Walmart coming soon. Don't think so, but you know, people have a little sense of humor there at the, at the camp. And uh, there were a few helicopters coming and going, uh, going out and checking out different, um, mostly state land, I think in, in this case, because you're on, when you're on the Colville River, you've got the Western Arctic, the National Petroleum Reserve to your left on your, to the west, and then to the east, you have all the state lands, about 20 million acres of state land that, that lies between the Colville River and the Canning River, the western boundary of the Arctic Refuge. So that there's a lot of room for, for, for development and exploration on state land. And I think there's some 30 fields that haven't even been developed on state land that they know the oil is there, um, that it, they could be developed in the future or not. Um, so it just, um, this is a, a huge area um, for oil and gas potential, um, the existing area, without going into the Western Arctic. But what I'm trying to say is there is a lot on state land that is, that is um, underway right now, like 30 producing fields and the biggest in our country, Prudhoe, Kaparik, Alpine, Milne Point, the list goes on of, of, of active producing fields. <clears throat> so interestingly, you've got all this oil and gas that's, that's in, under the tundra. Well, it, it comes from organic material, compressed organic material over millions of years. What I'm holding there in my left hand, I didn't know it at the time, is the ankle bone of a duck-billed dinosaur. So that was a surprise. I, I shared this photo with the curator down at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and he took one look and he said, yeah, you're, you're holding a, an ankle bone of a duck-billed dinosaur that lived on the North Slope 70 million years ago. I said, are you kidding me? I wasn't sure what it was, but uh, so I was near the Liscombe bone, uh, bone, uh, bone bed, which is the largest, um, pile of bones of dinosaur bones in the circumpolar north 
And I happened to be, you know, we happened to pull our canoe out near that and, and there it was crumbling out of the permafrost uh, off these big bluffs that cleave into the Colville River and are constantly little landslides are coming down from the erosion uh, that happens with the Colville, the flow of the Colville. Um, now we're getting out towards New Ixit. I'm hoping that Rosemary has been able to join us. Have we been able to find Rosemary? I don't think so, Debbie. So okay. it would be great if you could at least share the story of meeting yes. Rosemary with people. Yeah, that's what I was going to move into because I'm kind of now I'm I'm trying to 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 portray New Ixit is very close to where this picture was taken. This is this is like mile 375, and I, I want to say that I'm really sorry Rosemary is not on the call because she is one of my heroes. First of all, she has been one of the most outspoken people. Uh, a Nupiak residence on the North Slope who truly cares about her people, the health of her people, particularly because she is a, a health, a community health practitioner who has seen the health effects from oil development that, that borders the village. The Alpine oil field is just a few miles from their village. And the Kaparik, the, the huge Kaparik field is, is another dozen miles away. So oil development has moved mile by mile from Prudhoe Bay. It has grown like a spider web towards her community. And this is what we see as we're coming down the Colville. This is the Alpine oil field in the distance. It rises up like a small city. When you've been out on the tundra and you've seen no sign of civilization, you've only seen wandering caribou and birds and this rich abundance of life and then suddenly here, here rises the infrastructure of an oil field. Um, and so I met Rosemary 20 years ago. Um, and this is what it looks like when you're in an oil field, pipelines, gas flaring. This flaring, uh, if Rosemary was on right now, she would be talking about the pollution that comes from an oil field and the number of asthma cases that they have in New Ixit because of the gas flaring and the inversions that happen in the winter where all of the particulates settle over New Ixit. And then she, as the health aide, would get this increase, this spike in, in children and in adults coming in at night because they couldn't breathe because of this in, uh, inversion of the cold air sinking over the village with all of the nit um, nitrogen um, oxides and sulfur uh, dioxides that, that are settling amongst these homes. Um, and so she's lived it firsthand and she's a subsistence hunter. And she was the mayor of, of the village uh, when I visited New Exit 20 years ago to write a story about how people were dealing with oil development in their backyard. And she was a gracious host. She, uh, I got weathered in in New Exit for a week because of a blizzard where the snow was blowing sideways for three days. I had never seen snow blow sideways for three days, but the winds were so fierce um, that I was stuck in New Ixit and Rosemary took care of me. And she introduced me to just about every single person in the village so that I could write this article about the effects of oil development, which um, was very startling. Uh, while I was there, there were, there were notices on the public buildings that warning people not to eat uh, lingcod, burbot, a type of a fish they have in the Colville River because they had been contaminated with um, PCBs, benzene, other chemicals associated with oil development that had leached into the Colville from that place I showed you a few minutes ago, Umiat, the Naval Petroleum Reserve, when, when the Navy was there doing all these exploration uh, activities in the 1940s, they buried a lot of materials in a landfill that bordered the Colville River. It's now considered a Superfund site. Would take billions of dollars to clean it up because it's about a five mile stretch of materials that are buried. But all of these contaminants from these materials that were buried on the Colville River leached into the river and affected uh, fish in that area. And so there were notices saying, public health uh, notices saying, do not eat the livers 
of this particular fish because the contaminants, what's the word? Um, the contaminants um, solidify or they, 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 they go to the liver. And so it would be toxic for the elders particularly um, to eat these livers. And it was considered a delicacy for the elders. And they would eat tons of these livers at a sitting out of this particular fish. So they stopped utilizing that fish and people were very upset about it while I was there. Um, but there were other things that people were concerned about. People were not trained to go out and clean up oil spills. And I interviewed a woman who was cleaning up a diesel sp spill in the snow and, and she had been burned from the, the diesel fuel itself. Her, her She didn't have proper clothing. I heard stories like that stories of hunters that no longer could find the caribou in the places that they traditionally hunted, the caribou had been displaced because of all the, the traffic, the noise, the, the increased development around their village. So story after story um, in New Wixit on the effects of oil development on the people's health through Rosemary and other residents and uh, she has continued to work very hard on this over the years, educating people, uh, trying to get action taken, especially on contaminant issues. And we can all help um, in that way, being aware of it. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, Kristen, I think, plans to talk about what we can do to help the village of New Exit and those people that are trying to uh, stop the development from increasing to the point that the people can no longer access their subsistence foods and to the point where we have issues you know, about air pollution that affect the health of these, of these people. About, they're about, when I was there, there were 450 people that lived in New Exit. Uh, that was 20 years ago. And today I'm not, I'm not sure if we're more or less now, but it's, it's, it's a pretty good sized village. Some villages only have a hundred people uh, New Exit is a, is a fairly good sized village and they really depend on the resources, uh, whaling and harvesting um, caribou and fish as, as a very important part of their way of life. Um, last slide that I had that I'll share because it gives you a sense of the magnificence of a, a big caribou herd. This is the largest grasslands we really have in the United States, the Utacoc upland uh, tundra here, all these grasslands. And, and then the caribou thrive on this, this country. Um, and, and this gives you a sense of what they sound like when they aggregate together in a large herd. Um, this picture was actually taken in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. get a sense of how the land is flooded with caribou when they gather together. And in this particular picture, there might be 60, 70,000 animals. Uh, and you know, imagine the Western Arctic herd with uh, upwards of you know, close to 300,000 animals in one herd. Um, this is a miracle to witness this kind of life. It's not the place where you wanna have pipelines and roads and, um, there's so little of this kind of land left anywhere in the world. Uh, when former president Jimmy Carter came to visit the Arctic refuge, uh, he, he thought it was very similar to the Serengeti in Africa. And he was lucky enough to be in the midst of this herd. And he told me that oil development could never happen in a place like this, that there was this, this could never happen, was the way he put it. And of course, you know, today we carry on the torch for Adam and for all of the indigenous people, the Gwich'in people who have fought tirelessly for decades. They have fought to protect the sacred land where life begins that we're looking at right here. And um, these Arctic lands are like no other place that we have in the world, like no other place in the world let alone our nation, but in the world. And so we do have a huge responsibility 
to do what we can to encourage our our uh, administration who's Kristen can say I'm very happy with the new administration because I think President Biden understands climate change. He knows the importance of protecting lands and not extracting more and more fossil fuels, which only increase our, our problems with climate change. And he's been outspoken to say that we should have no more oil and gas leasing on public lands. That's a strong statement. Kristen, do you wanna chat a little bit about what we can do? Sure. Um, Hillary, I'm curious if, if you want to put any of the maps up, uh, just to um, sort of talk about the context of where we are today. We've talked about it a little bit, but I mean, I think the big picture story for the reserve is this juxtaposition of this area that has a name and a history of management as if it's a place for oil, but it's really this incredible wilderness area. Um, you know, there has been some amount of activity towards oil and gas development, but really, as you can see from what Debbie talked about, the, the, the reality on the ground is this is basically still an untouched wilderness. And in recent years, you know, we've been seeing a little bit more of the expansive development, um, uh, but there's still so much, there's, there, there, that is just the beginning and the communities are on the ground are really are starting to voice the, the impacts of that development. And so we're kind of at the beginning of the story of what we can do to protect it. Um, and, and so here we are with this administration that came in and you know we're all so excited. They've clearly prioritized climate change. They've prioritized climate justice and environmental justice and, bio, and the protection of biodiversity, all of these issues that kind of come together in the story of the reserve. Um, what the Biden administration did when they came in is they, what Debbie was saying, that they basically just put an all across the country pause to new fossil fuel leasing. Now that is going to be something that they are deliberating over in the future and they're going to have to make decisions about what oil and gas development goes forward. They also made a very specific decision and, and I don't know if, the, if we ended up with the Willow map, there it is. Um, it's kind of, it's going to be a little bit, oh, there's Rose. <laughs> I wish she could have joined us. Um, so, I mean, this map is really hard to read. Um, and so don't, you know, I'll just try to do my best. But essentially, you can see those boxes there and some of the over, like, overlapping layers. This is the development that, that we're like looking at. This is development that's coming at us. And, you know, so the Greater Moose's Tooth, these are the development projects that I was talking about that really have been green lighted in the past few years that have been going way too fast. And this is what we hear from Rose and we talk to her is that the communities on the ground, they see the impacts from this. They see the pollution from this. They see the changes in migration patterns. They see the changes in animals, but they aren't seeing the comprehensive study to truly understand what the reality of this oil and gas means. And that's what we need. We need to slow down on all of it. You know, the climate crisis asks for it. The on the ground reality asks for it. The communities that are suffering that rely on these resources ask for it. And so we need this pause in oil and gas development to really be a pause and a reconsideration of everything that we're doing on lands across the country, but especially in the National Petroleum Reserve. Um, so what was in that map was also a box that said Willow. Um, that is actually a major oil and gas project that is still like under consideration. It's under litigation. We're part of that litigation. Yep, right there. Um, and that is something that the, actually the Biden administration, when they came, came in, they made a specific announcement about um, taking the time to reevaluate the legal implications of. We think that the way that that the um, permits that were granted for that project were done illegally, they were done too fast without the right um, environmental analysis. We litigated and the Biden administration said that they were going to reconsider whether that project should go forward. So we have many layers that the Biden administration is currently considering. There's the on the ground projects that are left over from the Trump administration that we want them to stop and completely reconsider. And then there's the really big picture overall management of the National Petroleum Reserve um, that is this management plan that we were talking about that the Trump administration put in in the final days in office that really goes to how the entirety of the reserve is going to be managed in the years to come. And so the Biden administration has given us this opportunity to talk to them and have a conversation with them about what the future of all of this looks like. 
it is clear that we can't go forward the way that we have in the way that we have been permitting and moving forward with oil and gas in this country and still address the climate and biodiversity crisis. And so it's really a national conversation as much as it is right down to the, you know, to the birds that um, and the and the plants and the and the ecology that Debbie was showing in her presentation. And so and so there's a ton of opportunity and we are just at the beginning in this conversation with the Biden administration. So those of you that are on our list, those of you that we communicate with regularly, you're going to be hearing from us about this and about how we want to go to the Biden administration and tell them that we need to reconsider everything in the National Petroleum Reserve. Debbie was talking um, before we all got on the presentation together that um, that oil and gas development at the very least should be the exception. And we actually should reconsider whether oil and gas development belongs at all in this era. You guys have seen the land and you understand what the communities are depending on. And so that's the conversation we need to have. It's a big conversation. It's the conversation that's going all over the country. And it is a difficult conversation in an area that's called the National Petroleum Reserve. But the Biden administration understands this and everybody understands that we're having this climate and biodiversity crisis. And so we just need to think completely differently. This is an area that has been in federal, you know, in federal management for a hundred years. It's been in DOI management since the seventies, but we haven't had this really hard and look backwards to make sure that we're, what we're doing is right for the area. And now is the time for us to like, take a step back, stop, and really reconsider what we're doing with all of our public lands, but especially for the National Petroleum Reserve Alaska. So you're gonna be hearing more from us about this. And you know, this is really one of our most important campaigns. And we really wanna to get to a place where this is an area that we see strong protections for the special areas. And maybe we reconsider whether oil and gas development belongs there at all. Thanks, Kristen. Um, we have a number of questions. so. Um, Debbie, do you mind if we get started with a little bit of questioning? No, absolutely. Love the questions. Cool. Okay. Well, so um, someone asked about Trump act, the, how many Trump actions are reversible, and I feel like Kristen, you you addressed kind of what where we are with the responding to Trump's actions. So, um, if you have more questions about that one, just go ahead and text in the chat, and I'll follow up with that. Um, but the second question was, um, there, someone was interested in the indigenous and cultural history of the reserve before 1924. And I wondered if, Debbie, you know anything about that? I mean. Uh, before 1924, that, that would be a time way before my time. That would be before my father was born. So I'm not that as familiar, but there were certainly villages on the North Slope prior to 1924. Um, I mean, now today there are eight villages on the North Slope or, or on the fringe, you know, of these areas that we're talking about. Um, and whether all eight were there prior to, 20, to 1924, I'm, I'm certain that uh, several of them were. Akasik may not have been founded, that there's, that's a one village that's in from the coast. Nuiqsut would not have been founded prior to 1924, that's a more recent settlement, New Ixit, but say uh, Barrow, Wainwright, of course, Point Hope is one of the, I think it is the oldest settlement in America. Of, I mean, of all settlements in our entire country, Point Hope, I think, is the oldest settlement where people have continually lived in that area since they crossed the Bering Strait. So that's definitely going back. Um, amazing, really, when you think about it, that, that Point Hope has had that kind of, you know, continual, um, um, you know, the ancestors of Anupiaq people have lived there for thousands and thousands of years. Um, but I don't know if that answers the question. I, I think it's very, what, what Kristen was saying that I just want to comment on about the purpose of this National Petroleum Reserve to me is really interesting. When President Warren Harding established it in 1923, it was right after World War I. And there had been some oil seeps described back in the late 1800s along the North Slope of Alaska, a place called uh, Cape Simpson or Simpson Bay. And USGS, a, a crew went up there in the early 1900s and described those oil seeps. I think, I think like in 1909 or something. So Harding knew this 
that there had been oil seeps reported in this area and he was concerned for national defense purposes that he just reserved that whole area. None of it had been explored, just these oil seeps along the coast. But he reserved that whole 23 million acres, thinking that if there was another world war, you know, this would be a place that we could look for oil. Um, but the, the key word is emergency, which I, which I think is an important concept. Why should we be commercially developing this now in 2021 when we know it's bad for the environment and for climate change? We know that the, that the polar bears offshore are losing their sea ice world because of climate change. We know it's bad for the environment. We know oil spills are lethal. We know these things now that what oil development brings, what it brings to New Ixit. Um, so why now? What is the emergency? Why should we go into a reserve that was set aside for defense purposes? Why should we commercially develop it? I mean, it's a really, it really needs to be explored, the whole concept to me, as to maybe it should stay a reserve forever. Keep it in the ground. Maybe there will be an emergency some, someday where you'd have to go in there because there's something that can only be used something that we use in our civilization that can only use petroleum and we're down to our last barrel, you know? But why now? It makes no sense now with climate change. Or maybe climate change is the emergency. Yeah. <laughs> we need that stuff in the ground. Right, yeah, it is the emergency. Yeah, it is, sure enough. Um, so someone asked if, um, yes, there, so oh, someone asked if where they can access more of these wildlife recordings, and I think we shared the Encounters North link. Are there any other places where people can find um, all the wildlife sound recordings? Yes, I mean, I think your best bet is EncountersNorth.org, okay. which, which they're all of uh, Nels's um, natural history programs. They're each 30 minutes long, and they are all on the website, all 100 plus of them. And then also now they're available via podcasts through Spotify. So if you go to Spotify and you put in Richard Nelson uh, Encounters North, it should come up. So you can okay. you know, download them if you're traveling or listening, you know, listen to them if on your, your iPhone or whatever. Um, but, but the website has all the programs and they're, they're great. You can travel to Australia, to the Arctic. He's got a great caribou program on there that, that he recorded in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. And um, uh, I think he's got one on the Utacock as well, Utacock River, the special the uh, special area that you just saw some pictures from that area. Okay, thank you. And another question was around hunting of the bears and caribou. Do you know um, what's happening, you know, kind of what the rules are around that? And we know that caribou are an important subsistence resource for communities in the um, reserve. Yes. Yeah, you know, what more people were interested in the overall rule? Yeah, it's an extreme, the Western Arctic herd is the largest herd we have in, in North America now. I think we even outnumber the Canadian herds now. So it's a huge herd. It has a huge range and, the, and there are 40 communities that rely on that herd for sustenance. And uh, we're talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of 13, 14,000 people that are in those 40 communi communities. So these are villages, they're small little villages um, that rely on, on the caribou for their, to feed their families and have for thousands of years. That really hasn't changed the importance of the caribou. Um, but it's, the herd is carefully managed by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game and so they do annual census, you know, numbers they're checking. They have season and bag limits. Um, you, just, you just can't go out and shoot caribou any day of the, of the year. It's, it's carefully managed. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Um, and then there's certain times of the year where you can't hunt caribou. Say during the calving season, you don't, people are not out hunting caribou when they're having their, you know, giving birth to their young. Okay, um, and which river was were the Venice beads found? Oh, that was 
the beads, that little area, that was Etivalik Lake, which is near Etivalik River, which mm -hmm. flows into the Colville River. Cool. And um, I just want to, we're a little past time, so I just wanted to ask if you would share, I, if you remember from your book, there's a, speaking of caribou, lovely little story about the caribou babies and how they need to follow their mothers across the rivers. And they, there's a certain um, dialogue that goes on between the mothers and babies. And sometimes when they get to the shore, they struggle to get up the banks. And you shared a little story about that and how the mothers ended up helping them as they can't carry them. Yes. I wonder if you could share how that, that little story before we end. Yeah, well, it was, it, it was amazing evening it was maybe two o'clock in the morning of course there's no darkness and there were 10 20 30,000 caribou they were just crossing the river near where we were camped and 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 I watched many calves taking their might have been their first swim following their mothers and and most of them were doing pretty doggone well they would stay right next to their mother you know right on her tail you know, paddling their little legs, you know, trying to keep up with big mother. And they are in constant communication, the, the cows and the calves. And so that was interesting as well. So they identify their, their particular calf by voice. And so the, the mother is constantly making this sort of hum, hum kind of sound. And the, and the little calf is answering. Every time the cow makes the sound, the calf answers. Hum. And it, it, and it sounds like as you're listening to all these voices, and it's quite a din, it's very loud when you have thousands of cows all calling to their calves, but it sounds a bit like the, the mothers are saying, come, come, come. And it sounds like the calves are saying, wait, wait, wait. So it's kind of a come, wait, come, wait, come, wait. And you just hear thousands of these voices. It's a it's phenomenal thing to witness. And in this particular case, um, there was a calf that was a little bit weaker than the other calves, you know, not, not as strong and um, basically got a little washed downstream and, and got onto a little bank, a little, uh, little gravel bar. And then the mother had, ma had made it up onto the, the bank of tundra and was walking along the bank, calling for the calf who was below her, below the cut bank. And the calf was trying to go up that cut bank and it went, you know, maybe three or four steps. And then, it, it then, then the cut bank started to crumble and it kind of somersaulted back down to the shore of the river. This is on the other side of the river where we were watching this. And I, I almost wanted to get in my canoe, you know, and like go over and like pick up the calf and put it up on the, on the cut bank. But the mother found another way. She kind of went upstream she found a place where she could walk down and then she ended up getting the calf and leading the calf back up and around. It was just amazing to watch though how hard that calf tried to get up and, and the mother was waiting for her. And then finally she figured out, I gotta, I gotta change this, this you know, change the, the path. And, and she went back and got the calf. They're, they're incredibly attached to each other. And then I will, if, if we have time, I can share the, the picture of the one that there was one that uh, another calf that couldn't get up the bank and the mother went downstream and disappeared. And that particular calf swam back across the river to our camp. And I do have a, I do have a picture of that. And I do have the sounds of the calf. Nels was with me and he recorded the calf as it walked up to me thinking I was the mother. And it's pretty amazing because it was all by itself and the mother was downriver. And I, I can, I can, if I share screen, I can show you that last picture of the calf if you want to hear what a calf sounds like when it's in your lap. <laughs> I can put that on if you want me to put it on. Yeah, share it and then we'll... All right. Bye. Yeah, will, this will be the last one. Um, I think I've got it on here. Pretty sure. Okay. Udacock. There's a cow. There's Nell's recording right there. And here's the little calf that had lost its mom and it was swimming back and it, this is two in the morning. And then it, this is what it did.
can kind of hear it running away. Oh, I heard a dog bark. Um, <laughs> that was not my Yes, sound. my dog is very into the cat. <laughs> <laughs> the, the little cap, you know, I, I ask kids when I play that, those sounds for kids, and I ask them, what does it sound like? What that cap is saying? And the kids usually say, help, help. You know, it sounds like, and then one kid raised his hand once and said, milk, milk. <laughs> So they did reunite. That was the happy ending. It, this Yay. little cat dog right up to, you know, just about jumped in my lap and then it pranced off down the river and, and you know, met up with the cow that was down river that we were able to see that. Um, but uh, for a while, this calf was feeling pretty lost, little guy. And, and it happens, they get separated, but surprisingly not that often because the mothers keep such good track of them by voice and by calling to them, you know, and, and some of these calves don't want to cross the river. They're, they're standing there terrified. And, and the mothers have to coax them and urge them and poke them. And then, you know, once in a while, you, you'll see one that'll just said, no way, mom. <laughs> so yeah, incredible bond between them though. <clears throat> thank you so much, Debbie. Um, and thank you everyone for hanging out with us for the last uh, hour and 20 minutes. It's been yeah. nice having you. Um, and yeah, uh, we'll say good night and we'll hope to see you with, um, to join us with John Luther Adams coming up in um, on June 6th. So take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening and we will be in touch soon. We'll send out a recording. Bye. Thank you.